Uh, I'm pleased to welcome Yunan Chen as our speaker today. Uh, she's done amazing work in, in various aspects of health informatics. Um, and today she's going to be talking to us about uh, patient-driven work and, and how we should be thinking a little bit more about uh, maybe the ethics of it and, and other areas. So welcome to Yunan. hear me okay? I'm trying to use the microphone here. Um, so today I'm trying to uh, talk about some of the work my student and I have been doing in the past three years um, in understanding how healthcare consumers, um, such as patient, caregiver, or just the healthy individuals with certain needs in healthcare, um, how they engage in their own healthcare with um, the facilitation of um, healthcare technologies. So to start with, I want to share you a story of engagement. It's a real story. I will walk you through this story to tell you how a patient engaged in her own care. So this is Rachel. She found out she was pregnant in September 14, uh, in the middle of September 14, 2014. And then she called her doctor and got referred to an OBGYN. So she went to see her OBGYN JYN on the first day on, on October 2nd, 2014. It was her first OBGYN appointment back then, and she was pretty relaxed. She did not prepare a thing. She went into the office, and she didn't even really know which doctors she's going to see because it was that was group practice. She went into the office, and got ultrasound exam, which many of you may have saw that before. And everything went fine. She can hear the baby's heartbeat, everything. But all of a sudden, the doctors told her, well, there's something strange on your ultrasound. I want to take another look. After a few seconds, the doctor told her, well, there seems to be a very large ovarian cyst. And so Rachel asked her very anxiously, so what does that mean? What should we do about it? The doctor told her, well, I don't know yet. We need to have another ultrasound exam with a fancier machine so we know what's going on. So they booked appointment on the next Monday, October 7th, to have the ultrasound exam. So during that four days, Rachel did not wait passively. She went back home, she asked all her friends and relatives possibly whoever knows the situation, and nobody actually knows, right? So what she did is she went online, she searched for ovarian cyst, and she searched for pregnancy. She got all the scientific information on this professional website, and she was not completely happy with it, until she found there is a thread on the online community called babycenter.com, that people actually talked about their experience during pregnancy having ovarian cyst. So as you can see here on this particular post, there is 143 women mom actually answered the question. And normally the answers are in the form of, I also experienced this, this is what happened to me. This is how big, it's, this is how big my cyst was, this is what I did, what happened to me. And there are actually multiple such kind of threat online, and there's normally sometimes a hundred, sometimes a couple of moms who have experienced this share their experience. So during that four days, Rachel read through all these posts, and she had a really good understanding about what's going on. She learned about their different cysts exist. There could be liquid, it could be solid. She learned that from people sharing experience, most people who have similar experience, similar size of cyst, they had done a surgery during the second trimester of pregnancy. And normally the, the surgery is done by what is called laparoscopic surgery. So you use it, you dig small holes on the belly and you do that surgery. And normally if you don't do anything, the cyst could go very large and it could be ruptured and twisted and you ended up in the ER. And very, very less likely this will be cancer. So even before she went to see her ultrasound technician to get the ultrasound test, Lucy knew that probably she will have to do a surgery. So she got to refer to 
what is called a uh, um, gynecological gynecological oncologist, and she got referred to this doctor to do her surgery on October 14 to do the first consultation. Surprisingly, this doctor told her, right, oncologist said, well, I actually prefer to do the surgery at the end of the first trimester, which is different from what Rachel learned online. So what she had to do, she took the courage to ask this doctor, how many such kind of surgery have you done in the past? And this oncologist said, well, one a month, probably 20. So after hearing that, Rachel had this feeling like she probably wanted to find another person to operate on her. So what she did afterwards, luckily she figured out uh, there's a way for her to get another insurance to get actu actually get to see other kind of doctors. So she went back online to search for doctors. She went to the professional website uh, for oncologists. She found out there's a different website that you can get doctor's reviews. Some of them are on Yelp. Some of them are on very professional websites, such as HealthGrid or Vitals.com. So in the next few days, she created a list of gynecological, gynecologist, oncologists, sorry. She checked the insurance policy to find out whether this doctors she found online in her region is actually in her network. She examined under review of these doctors and she set up appointment to talk with these doctors. So finally, she found someone she really liked that shared the same value and talked about the surgical plan that matched her expectation. And she did the surgery, everything went fine. So this is the story, a little bit long. So I wanna share this story because as you can see within this two months period, things have changed a lot. From the first appointment that Rachel did not do anything, she did not prepare things, she did not even research on her doctor, she became more and more engaged in her own healthcare. And she advocated for herself, she asked questions, she reviewed things online, she prepared before her visit, and she reflect what's going on after her visit. So this is what we think patient engagement should be. So I want to ask a few questions, right? When did Rachel become engaged in her healthcare? She was not very engaged at the beginning, and she turned out she come to become more and more engaged over the course of her treatment. And can you guess whether she stopped being engaged after the surgery? Well, she did it. She actually continued doing that for her own care and for her baby. And what was the role for healthcare technology in this whole process? She did not start from healthcare technology, but online communities and all kinds of websites definitely helped her to find more information, to become more and more engaged. And then I'm also gonna talk in today's talk about whether engagement is always positive and how can we design something to make patients like Rachel have a better experience. So this is the structure of my talk. I'll review the literature about patient engagement, what we think patient engagement, engagement is, and what people have looked at it in the um, research community. And then I'll talk you through two lines of research. I call this engaged but burdened patient. And the second line of research, we look at informatics tools that designed to support engagement. And by the end, I will review this two line of research and talk about what it means for engagement and how can we design better technologies to support engagement. So I start with this. You guys probably all have heard about patient engagement or patient empowerment. There is a general science that patient used to be the most passive role in the entire healthcare delivery, right? They're passively waiting to receive the healthcare service. They don't do much about their own care. So the, the whole idea about patient engagement or patient empowerment is we're gonna turn passive into active. By doing that, patient would take an active role in their own care, own healthcare, and they're gonna make informed decision and share decision with their healthcare providers. And there will be better healthcare communication with their healthcare providers. And eventually this is gonna lower, lower the healthcare costs and improve the healthcare outcomes. And I really wanna say that 
the patient engagement and empowerment has been used interchangeably in the literature, right? There's a subtle difference, but I'm not gonna talk too much about this. It has been used almost similarly um, in the literature. So when we think about patient engagement and empowerment, information technology play a key role. If you search for that, you often have seen technology designs to promote engagement. This would include things, for example, online patient portal, and many of you may have access to it. You can log in, you can see your medical record, your lab result, you can communicate with your doctors directly. This could mean social media online communities, like I just mentioned. This could be wearable, wearable devices or mobile health apps that are on your phone that help you to better manage your healthcare. And eventually, it will help patients to generate something what we call patient-generated health data. This is a data beyond the clinical environment. Patient can monitor, create that data, and help, their, help themselves to manage their own health, and help healthcare uh, providers to know what happened outside of clinical environment. So you can see I gave you some examples here. This is from the Office of o, um, National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. They have a patient engagement playbook, which emphasized on patient portal and health IT. This is another example. As you can see, the mobile app market is growing very fast. And there is a report, recent report showing that by 2015, there's actually 165,000 mobile apps health-related, mobile healthcare-related mobile app, and that number almost doubled in three years. So there's a lot going on in industry. There is a growing interest about patient engagement or designing technology to promote patient engagement or let patients do something about their own health. However, we also hear these warning signs, right? The technology is a must, but it would not cure all. And in this article, it actually said, well, the patient engagement tools are often underused. We've seen a lot of research study talking about those mobile apps, those technologies. You design for patient, but it's not being used longitudinally. They may use it for a short period, period of time, and many of them were abandoned afterwards. So in this particular article, it said, well, patient engagement tools are too often used haphazardly. We don't really know a plan how to use it. We don't have specific thinking about how and why patients would want to engage with those technologies. And also, in the research articles, and people have been talking about patient engagement is nothing but, but a buzzword, right? We've been talking about it, we really don't know. There's, there's not a shared understanding or definition about it. We don't really know how to measure it. We don't really know how to design things for it. And there's more articles about this. Um, just one more example. So this is a wheel. I really love this picture, so I put on my slides. And this is really what people have been talking about. It's great. We've been approaching patient engagement from a different perspective, perspective, thinking about a lot of different technologies. But what really is patient engagement? And more importantly, how can we make patients engage, right? How can we trigger that engagement? How can we sustain that engagement? So with that understanding about patient engagement, what happens and people's understanding about that, I'll talk about a project we did, I call this engaged but burdened patient. So this is a project we call, under the umbrella we call navigational healthcare. We've been doing this project with my students since 2016. We have, we, we try to study when people, individual patients, they have to encounter the healthcare system in the US, most of them, this product in the US. We often say the US healthcare system is very complicated, complex, and fragmented. So we wanted to look at what kind of challenges that patient actually encountered when they seek healthcare service and what they did to overcome those kind of breakdowns or challenges and what is the role of healthcare technology played into it. So within that umbrella, we studied new parents taking care, taking care of their newborn and how they seek healthcare service for their kids. We look at immigrant students when they were first into the US, they have to see a doctor, what kind of challenge they actually encounter. 
we look at individuals when they are facing, when they were facing a public health crisis, for example, Zika. Nobody knows what's going on. How do they draw information online? How do they more make personal health information decision around that? We also studied specifically house, online health communities, and we're in the process of studying physician rating set. So today I'm going to talk about this um, primarily around the project of how new parents navigate healthcare system for their baby. So just as an example I showed you at the beginning, like Rachel, we interviewed 35 new parents and almost every single one of them have encountered various <coughs> infrastructure breakdown. So we call this infrastructure breakdown because if something happened in the healthcare infrastructure and they have a difficult time to go through. And then we categorize them into three levels. These are including individual level breakdowns. It could be someone within the healthcare organization made a mistake or did not act on something quickly enough that lead to a breakdown. For example, a doctor forgot to request a pre-authorization for a procedure that the patient received a high bill. That's individual level breakdown. Or there could be organizational level breakdown. There is multiple healthcare organizations, a clinic a patient has to see, and including the pharmacy, the insurance company. Across all these organizations, there's a lot of coordination failures, right? So one participant in the study told us, right, she repeatedly asked the OB office to send her medical record to a specialist office, but the specialist office never received it. What she did to overcome that challenge, she went to the OB office and made a copy herself and drive and delivered that to the other office, right? In Rachel's case, I just mentioned the beginning, before she had to do the surgery, she had to send the ultrasound image from her OB office to the surgeon's oncologist's office. And she brought a CD that the OB office created for her. She went to the oncologist's office and they were shocked. And they said, we don't have a machine to read this. <laughs> so what she has to do is she had to go back and she had to reformat that image into a different format and email her doctor. Right. So individual has to do a lot to overcome that kind of breakdown. And there are also other kind of spatial temporal policy and financial breakdowns that individual encounter, right? Maybe you're under a tight schedule, but this is not going to happen within your schedule. You have to do the surgery by this date, but it takes longer for the doctor to schedule it. Maybe you have to receive the healthcare service under a certain facility, certain location, you just don't get it. And there's also policy financial breakdowns, right? One example I want to share with you, this morning my one-year-old had a ear infection. I went to the urgent care this morning and I want to pick up his prescription. It's interesting I found there's a two medication was prescribed to us. One before insurance is $130 and after insurance I pay $3, which is great. The other medication, it's $300, but after insurance, I still have to pay $250 on that. And I asked, what's going on? And the pharmacist is like, I have no idea. You should check your OB, you should check your pediatrician, you should check your insurance. We have no clue what's going on. So luckily, I'm able to afford that, but not everybody can afford that. So many people we interviewed, they have to find ways to work around that situation. Many times they work around that situation through asking friends or asking online, finding different tips, that different strategies for them to receive their healthcare service in a way that is affordable to them or it's um, um, something to help them to overcome those kind of breakdowns. So what I really wanted to say here is, well, we all experience that kind of breakdown, but what we found through that product is individuals actually engage in what we call infrastructure work. There's no way for them to change the entire healthcare organization or change the policy, but they do small work and try to fix and align those breakdowns encountered to them. And they, this is ongoing work that individuals continue to do to help them get a satisfied healthcare service. In a way, we call this is a way to help people, people to reconfigure and construct a micro, micro a micro healthcare system that works for them, right? 
this is the system that I needed, the service I needed for my particular situation, health situation, my financial situation, and my personal preference. People have to work to create that functioning healthcare system for them. More importantly, what we learned through this study is almost like, almost every single one of this, um, those people we interviewed, they reflected on their experience and they almost always had talked about if I knew something, I would have done better. I might have do things differently if I were given a chance, a second chance. So people really actually go through this process of encountering healthcare service and breakdowns and figure out a way to fix those breakdowns and reflect on their experience and learn from that. So in our paper, we talked about that individuals actually gain the skills and competence by doing, engaging in this kind of infrastructure work. And many of them become more and more engaged through doing that kind of work. So through this study and some of other study I don't have time to talk about, the engaged patient, right, are often those patients are confronted with a difficult health situation. There is a situation, there's a problem they wanted to solve. They have the in, internal motivation to solve that problem. It requires dedicated and persistent work from the patient to solve those breakdowns. And those work eventually turns into competence and skills. And those competence and skills sustain long-term engagement. If we think about the Rachel's case, she still engaged patients over many years. And that never goes away, right? She learned how to be engaged, and then she's continued doing, being engaged. And health IT system is a, is a great tool to enable that kind of engagement. But oftentimes, healthcare IT is not what initiated this engagement. People oftentimes do not really go to this health system or app saying that this is gonna change my life. I'm gonna take care of myself differently. Um, they have encountered a difficult health problem, then they start from there and discover the technology that can help with them. But engaged patient is also very burdened. This is a picture, it's not a good picture. This is a picture of a patient actually trying to sort out her bills, right? You get a lot of bills from your, this is probably something unique in the US. I, I don't know about other countries. This is unique in the US. Many people got surprising bills, right? Thinking about the Rachel's case I just mentioned to you, she did check whether the surgeon is covered under her network, but after the surgery, she still got a surprising bill. That is because the facility was not covered under her network. And you encounter a lot of that, right? There is actually um, a reporter from Vox is trying to collect those surprising bills and trying to uh, configure collectively collectively what's really happening in our healthcare system. And this is one example, right? The engaged patient has to do a lot of work and sometimes they're really burdened. There's a physical burden, there's emotional burden, mental burden, and there's a temporal financial burden. I'm sure you have sensed that from my talk. So the next line of research, I'm gonna talk about what, what I call informatics tools designed for engagement. So we've been doing this work since 2017. And even before that, I have done some work with people with chronic illness, um, trying to figure out how to use self-tracking tools to help them better manage their healthcare, including patients with migraine, right? How they document their syndrome, their feelings, their triggers, trying to figure out what's going on with them, what triggers their illness, what is the best way for them to cope with migraine. Um, including diabetes, for example, what food will lead to a higher level of glucose reading for this particular person. So today I am picked the two projects that in the context of women's health that in line with my previous work. So starting from 2017, my student Mayara and um, a postdoc who's not here, we've been doing work self-tracking for women's health. So I will, I will talk about two specific projects. One is fertility tracking. Women track their syndromes, so they track their personal data in order to get pregnant. And the other is more interesting. There is something called digital birth control, right? 
is a digital app designed as a birth control. So I really want to say like when we started that project, we didn't really look at patient engagement specifically. But to think about you give patients a tool, ask them to do something about their own healthcare, itself is turning passive into active is engagement. It's under the umbrella of engagement. So we were interested in nitro cycle for multiple reasons, right? Apparently this is a digital birth control, it's interesting enough. And it's also the first FDA approved digital control, digital birth control. So at the time we started this project, we were really interested to say, what is is there anything different? Is there any changes or impact on people's acceptance to this tool when it is FDA approved? Would people trust the app more when it is labeled with FDA approval? So we're still in the process of doing this project. So the first step for us to do that project is we look at all the reviews for this app, right? Including things in the online communities and people talk about how they use it including the app review, we crawled app review from app stores, from Google Play, including the media report about NitroCycle. So I wanna show you a very short video about NitroCycle and give you a sense about how it works. NitroCycle uses an algorithm that is sensitive to the menstrual cycle's subtle patterns. It learns your unique cycle by analyzing your basal body temperature, which is your resting temperature. To use natural cycles, you need to add it to your morning routine. Wake up. Good morning. Measure right away. Don't go to the bathroom. Sorry. Don't have a drink of water. Measure first using a basal thermometer. This will give you your temperature with two decimals. Enter your temperature into the app. When you do this regularly, the algorithm can learn your cycle and will be able to determine your ovulation. So this is the idea, right? How it's gonna work. Um, it sounds easy. You just measure and you put your data into the app. And if you guys paid attention to this, it's actually mentioned multiple times that the algorithm or smart algorithm is gonna calculate and give you a prediction, right? That's gonna be accurate. So the first step, we, we analyzed the online reviews for this app, and surprisingly, most people give the five star to this app, right? Um, and you can sense that empowerment and engagement through these reviews, like I picked two examples here. Women just said, well, this app makes you feel empowered and in more control. And the other person said, well, I've been struggling with this for, um, um, for this birth control for a long time. I really love that I hate, I mean, many, many women actually mentioned that. The reason they really love this app is because they hate hormones. They hate other kind of pills, everything got into their body. And then many of them said, well, I feel like I'm so in control. I can control things right now, right? So if you think about engagement and empowerment, feeling empowered and feeling um, in control is one definitely one of criteria if we think about one dimension if we think about empowerment. So women really like this app, right? And many, many reviews we read actually have this sense of they love this app. Many of them said, well, we've been, I've been using this app for two cycles or three cycles. I love it, right? They love this app. Well, this app is not because it's really helps them <coughs> to prevent pregnancy because who get to know that in just two months? But many of them mentioned that apps help them to learn about their body. Like this comment actually said, right? I'm 27, honestly, I should know about my body, but I didn't. Then I used through using this app, I get to know more and more about my body, my mood, my cycle, everything. That's a great tool for me. And the other person also mentioned, right? That um, I thought I was in tune with myself. I'm now learning so much, right? So there's, repeated message from this app review that we found out that that's a sense of giving people something that they could learn about themselves is a process of empowering them. I also wanted to mention, right, you, you guys all saw that ads. 
um, there's some effort in collecting that data, even though it's it sounds like as easy as you just measure your body temperature every morning, but there's actually quite some work, right? You have to measure at exact time, right after you get up, and then to to be able to for to to be able to get more accurate results, women actually have to have a very regular lifestyle, right? Okay. So many of them actually commented, well, this is not made for breastfeeding mother because with young children, I don't have the regular temperature, the regular, I could not measure it at the same time. And the other person said, well, it's just a really hard time for me to remember actually to keep, take my temperature, to put in the app, right? And there's another person actually talked about, right? I don't have a regular life, uh, lifestyle. I don't sleep at the same time and get up at the same time, the app result is not accurate because of my lifestyle. So there's a lot of effort actually goes into collecting that data. So guess what? If the data is not accurate, who's gonna suffer the consequences of all this? And there's actually a lot more effort people have to do in interpreting that data, right? So the app, this is what you get from the app. You get a green days, you get a red days. A green days, you're safe. A red days, you have to use protection. And there's not much explanation going on. And for many, many different type of apps, there's a very little explanation in general to provide <coughs> to users. I got my tracked sleeping data. I have no idea what it means by restless. I got this. I have no idea about how accurate it is, what information is used to make that prediction, what it means, how risky it is for how accurate is a green day or a red day. So a lot of women we sell, they bring their track data, this, this diagram, into a forum, into an online group, asking us, other women, what it means to me, right? How, how come I have more green days last month? I have a fewer green days this month. What it means to me? What happens to me? So they collaboratively trying to figure out what it means. So this is something interesting, right? I, I would say a lot of apps are designed in this way. They're smart, they give you prediction, but not much explanation what's really going on. So there's also a sense of a trust in that result. And we saw that when people talk about, well, I have tried different apps. But I like this one because you know there's accurate algorithm goes into this app even though they have no idea how things work in how algorithm actually work on this app right we also heard people are talking about things for example we have to work hard to earn that green days right I have to work hard to measure more to put more data to earn that green days that's an interesting thing to think about how algorithm actually work and how people actually perceive this algorithm so this is the study about natural cycle. We're still in the process of analyzing data. We probably will do some interviews to get more uh, feedback from women. Now I wanted to switch to another project, right? So we all think engagement is great. People engage in your own health, health care. You think about this all the time. You address all the health care issues. Is that always great? So I want to talk about a project that we found engagement can be negative. There are actually unintended consequences of engagement. So in the field of tracking, we all know that there is a lot of studies has been talked about mobile app and self-tracking tools, there's high rate of system abandonment, right? You use it for a while and you're done with that app, you switch to another one or you're not doing anything anymore. And then in that particular study, we found out Excessive, excessive physical and emotional burden associated with tracking. And people may experience fear and they would completely, completely stop managing their health at all. So this particular project is about fertility tracking, right? We get into fertility tracking and the interesting story. We were concerned, we were interested to do, to examine self-tracking and we wanted to find a health condition that is very, very tracking extensive. We went to an online community, we searched for tracking, and this is what we found, right? Apparently, women try to conceive, get pregnant, they track a lot of health indicators, and they try to configure, they try to figure out what's going on with them, so they could know the time to act on it. So fertility apps is actually a big market. There's a tons of articles talking about fertility apps, 
there's a more than 30 of them are on the market. In the study, we look at the online community that, dedicate, that, was, that is dedicated for fertility, infertility, and IVF. Many, many women actually bring their data, bring their question to the online community and try to collaboratively solve their problems, answer questions. For the sensitivity of this topic, right, we start with online community and we're actually in the process of trying to interview a real patient, but we start with online community and trying to understand what's really going on with those women. What we found out, many people actually talk about their experience online and we code it their experience, right? We wanted to take a look of their relationship with their track data. So women actually track a lot of information in order to know when is exact time, their ovulation time, right? What is their best chance to get pregnant? They track for body, body temperature, they track for various body signs. And they bring this data and try to figure out make sense of this data. And in our analysis, in our CSW paper with my student, Mayara, we, look, we talked about these five different types of engagement. We saw some women are really excited about tracking, about their data, right? Finally, I can see what's going on with me, right? Before I, ha I start tracking, I have no clue what's going on with my body. It's a black box, it's invisible to them. Now they can see it. They have this feeling of engagement, excitement, and empowerment under control. And many more of them start to feel burdened, right? Because they have no idea what's going on. They feel stressed, anxious, sometimes frustration. And then they think about, well, what's going on with my data? Why don't I see the result I wanted to see, right? Many of them tracked, but they do not see the ovulation date. Many of them tried for a few months, but nothing really happened to them. And over time, you could say, there are people talk about excessive tracking, obsessive tracking, right? They would track more and more, use different, five different toolkits to track, and then they would selectively, selectively trust whatever the toolkit give them the result they wanted to see. Right, the obsessive tracking is, it's, I have many friends also in that same situation. I, I know this, right? And eventually many of them feel trapped into tracking. Right, they feel guilty, they feel um, depressed. What's really going on with me? How come I've been doing this extensively for a long period of time and nothing really happened. And eventually the fifth type of engagement with data, we call this abandonment, right? I just can't handle it anymore. Then I gave up tracking and trying to get pregnant all completely. So I wanted to mention, right, this is a study. We analyzed the online forum and we saw different types of engagement with healthcare data. Some are positive, some are bothered, burdened, trapped. But we don't really know whether people are actually going through that stage of from positive to negative. And we're in the process of doing an interview study to see when women actually track, for example, six months a year, what really happens to them. So I want to mention this, right? We don't really think that the fertility tracking tool, for example, you use a mobile app, it is the only reason for people to track to have this negative e engagement. They may have this kind of feelings even without any kind of digital technologies, but we certainly see that digital technologies has added to the culture of tracking, right? It's so easy to track, you should use them. Everybody else is using the apps to track, you should use them. You should turn, this could turn something from invisible to visible, you really know your cycles, you really know what's going on. And that it contributes to the phenomenon of being tracked. If I'm designing a mobile app, a lot of apps are having this kind of concerns that if I'm a designer, I want people to use my app, right? I want people to engage with my app, to put more and more data into my app. By putting more and more data into the app, sometimes you have contributed to the feeling of being trapped. You're trapped, you're contributing more data, you're adding more data, and then you can't get stop, you can't stop with it. And in the way it accelerates the negative engagement, it did not start it, but it could make it worse. So this is the project we saw from the fertility tracking. Clearly we saw negative consequences with using the digital tools. So in general, for the tools we studied, 
For the tools we studied and for the other tools we, we actually studied other um, chronic illness, technology in general can turn something invisible into visible, right? By seeing your data, you have a sense about, I know what's going on, and give people a sense of control, right? I'm doing something that I'm helping myself. And for a lot of um, health conditions that we studied, those are the health conditions people don't have control, right? Do you have a control about what time you get pregnant? You have very little control about that. So they don't have control. By collecting that data, analyzing the, the, that data, looking at their data, they have a feeling of a sense of control. And the app helps people to connect with their health providers, with their peers. The apps, the technology in general help people to track visualize data and provide predictions, right? There's a lot of apps that are, are named under that intelligent or smart app, right? You don't have to do anything. We're just gonna we're gonna give you this, this data, this visualization, it tells you everything, right? Through the study, we actually found out, right, the, the technology could accelerate that negative engagement. And also, engagement in general comes with the effort. If you are engaged, you actually do something. You either look at your data, you either collect your data, you either learn something, your actual engagement comes with an effort. So towards the end, what does this two project mean to me, right? So we look at those four projects in today's talk, and then we look at individuals are facing difficult, complex health situations, sometimes that are even controversial. And we found out individuals become engaged when they make an effort to solve the problems. Through solving their problems, they, they gain competency <coughs> and skills, and then it would motivate them to engage more over time. And I actually saw this as the main motivation for people to continue engaged. So why? Why people, you give them a tool, they may not be engaged, but they are engaged when they try to solve a difficult health situation. I tried to look for theories and to explain that, right? There is a theory called um, psychological empowerment. It talked about empowerment in the sense of perception, skill, and action. Really, it means by how people feel about themselves, how, pe how people learn, and how people will do, right? And I really felt that this theory talked about, right, there is an uh, engagement, enga empowering process, which individuals have to make effort to gain control, to access resource, to learn the critical understanding of one's social political context. So in this paper, I actually talked about the examples of education setting, but in my own research, I've seen that, for example, the engaged patient like Rachel, she cannot change the entire healthcare system, right? She cannot change the policy. But by doing work engagement, gave her a sense of how policy actually works and how flexible, flexibility, how flexible the policies are and what she can actually do through the effort she made, she become engaged and she gained the skills and she would continue doing that. So this is the one theory I really like, explained a lot. And I've also been reading the, the paper that Judy sent me, uh, the self-determination theory. And I like it said that um, the happiness is something you earned, right? You have to invest, then you earn it. So for the time being, I'm not gonna talk too much about this. And then, for me, I really learned from those projects that engagement is earned and learned, right? Um, engagement does not come effortlessly. That's why you give people something smart. This is about you. They would not be engaged open times. And they have to go through this, work on it, learn it, and reflect it, and create a sense of control and knowing. This knowledge and skills would sustain long-term engagement. That's what I found from the studies. And let's take a look about that technology. So this are a lot of technologies. Apps are designed in this way, right? They give you the data, they give you a dashboard about what happens to you last month, last week. This is your sleeping data. This is your exercise. This is um, fertility, right? This is all kinds of things. So the technology are still designed at the stage of informing me. There's actually a paper talking about five stage of engagement and empowerment. The very low age is informing me. You inform the user, you inform the user, this is really happening, but you not, do not explain, you do not give them a chance to learn what really means, what they can do, right? So a lot of apps are smart and they're designed in this way. So this is a paper I talked about. 
So engagement in HCI, since I interest, I started interested in this topic, I paid attention to people. When they talk about engagement in HCI and design, oftentimes engagement is studied as usage, right? How much attention you pay to that app or that system, how much time you actually use that system collectively or during a day, how frequently you actually open and log into that system. That means engagement. And also a feeling, right? I feel that I'm empowered. I feel that I'm capable of doing things. So of course, people study that. And if you think about that, engagement in the sense of how much time and effort they spent, attention they actually paid to that particular system and app, which is the different from engagement in healthcare, right? So I read, um, people say the more attention you paid into the software itself, you actually overlooked what really happening outside of the software. So engagement is often studied in this sense. So I would argue that there's a different type of engagement we should talk about in health informatics, right? There's the engaging with the system, which means the clicks, the usage, the time, that you're really actually playing and using that software. And there's the engaging with data, with the personal data, right? How people actually learn and make sense and use that personal data is a different story from using the technology. And overall, there's the engagement with healthcare. There should be a positive health behavior out of engagement. It should not be that app asks you to think about, I'm not pregnant, I need to work hard every single second, right? It's not gonna help, and that would lead to negative consequences. So by the end, I just really wanted to summarize. Um, I think the design should encourage positive engagement in healthcare. Of course, we should lower the burden of patient work. Mm. Patients should not be like Rachel, that she has to work extensively, read through those posts and do all the things in order to get the knowledge. We should find ways to lower the burden. We should not let the patient to enter, for example, 10 different type of data into that system. We should lower the burden of gathering the data. But then we should provide them a chance to engage and learn from their data, right? This is about your last week, last month, what it really means. The app should, instead of smart enough to provide that, you should give people a chance to learn and to support the meaningful ways to be interact with health data. If this is show to have negative effect, there should be something for us to do to let people take a break or do things differently. And also, I think I really wanted to say that there should be a space to design the technology that is not so smart, right? You give people visualization, really what it means, right? I was puzzled with a lot of apps I've been using, right? I look at my sleep data as one example. I thought I slept for seven hours, and the app said, you have three hours of sleep, and the rest of the time, you're restless. What it mean by restless, <laughs> right? And how much sleep other people get. When I look at that smart result, I feel even more puzzled. So there should be a way for users to understand the result instead of just to give you this prediction, this visualization. There should providing the users a chance to learn. Learning is a way to make them more engaged. It's a way to keep them for long-term engagement. Making the system more transparent and self-explanatory, right? So that's something I saw a lot in the smart system design. What it really means, how do you get that? How, um, how is the way your algorithm actually work, right? And also helping people to navigate the difficult health situations. Um, so that's my talk. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Do you think engagement has a dark side? I'm thinking about the anti-vaccination people that they try to find things out about vaccination. Yeah. You know, the doctor said you should be, have your child vaccinated, and yet they got online and found all this bad information from one perspective, and it, they got passionate about resisting the doctor's advice and right. doing all this stuff. That strikes me that that's one of the risks that people can, if they're gonna go online, they'll find communities that are engaged, mm -hmm. they'll find the wrong people. Yeah. And you can get very bad stuff, like the anti-vaccination stuff. Yeah, that's, that's um, one thing we have not studied. Um, we've been studying primarily in the space of self-management that they already have an illness to begin with. 
Um, but that's, um, I think people are talking about fake news these days and that we also talk about misinformation online, uh, health information. And there has been some studies looking at online community passing on incorrect suggestions or dangerous suggestions to other people. Uh, how can we work on that? Um, I think in general, um, it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting topic. Um, I don't know how, whether I would call them engagement, but definitely there's a dark side of people are persistently working and then they're going to the wrong direction. And just as a fertility tracking as one example, it's not really something you tried really hard, you get a good result, and if you believe that, it will lead people to a more stressful situation. And I think many argue that it's even uh, harder for people to get pregnant, right? So um, I think this unintended consequences and negative consequences is something definitely interesting to take a look. So similarly, um, how you actually manage people understand the risk and the side effect of uh, you know, any procedure, any medication might impose, because I can imagine, you know, based on my own experience, every time I actually start reading about the side effect, I always get so scared. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, every time I actually take action, it's always like I just pretend I don't know about what ha might happen. So is there any case from the study? You know? Well, this is something interesting, right? So um, I talk a little bit about from the natural cycle example, right? So the natural cycle as a way that it's 93% accuracy, I think 93% of accuracy, right? Um, I mean, a lot of people, and also depends on actually you enter your data correctly in the right way. Um, but the apps talked about that risk, but a lot of women that we saw, they left comments. Um, I don't think they have a really good understanding about those risks. Mm. If this, something shows them the green day, they would blindly trust that result. Part of this is, this is a smart algorithm behind it, right? Um, so I think there's a part, I mean, that's a big question. There's a part of the health literacy issues, right? Uh, there's a part of how to educate people. And part of that, when we talk about healthcare IT, that as a way to design engage people, how do you explain that? How do you educate people to learn about their risk, right? It's not really 100% or what this really means to you. Um, I think um, just from what, the, the study I presented, I feel like there's a huge space that we need to do in there, right? Um, we should not just present this to people and leave them no clue what's going on, but we have to educate them. This is how your result was generated. This is how you should interpret and look at this and what it means. And I think that, uh, to me, is a more positive way of engaging them rather than just like your doctor throwing this, do not talk about risk, then you left you to in the situation of being scared. resourced and literate mm -hmm. and uh, agentic, right? Um, so how, how, how can you put those two pillars in conversation if you're talking about perhaps a different population that does not have those resources, um, even just the access to online information, let alone the online literacy or app use literacy? Yeah, that's a great question, right? Uh, so I have to admit, so most people we actually studied, they're actually in that, um, um, they're the background, right? Um, they have access to online resources, even the international student, the immigrant student, they're a student, they're graduate students. They may not be rich, but they have access to these online resources. They have the um, ability to understand those information. So we haven't really reached out to that population, that's partially the answer. Um, but also, um, I think that um, the process of that, in a way, those being literate, being how understand that, um, able to use the app, to pick an app, to afford a smartphone, everything, 
it's helping people to be engaged, but if we're not, help, we're not careful with that, it could also turn them into the dark side of engagement. That's what I try to say here, right? For people who don't have that access, of course, it's harder for them to get engaged, um, but they still, we, we've seen one or two cases that people actually get information maybe from their friends, maybe from their social network. It's just harder for them to get engaged to access that information. So I think at health IT, I take this as an um, enabler, right? It makes things easier, but it could also make the negative impact um, come out earlier, easier. So I think that's something we need to think about. How do we design those things carefully? And also I think we should study those populations to just to find out how they engage, and um, maybe there's a, there a way for them to engage, or what are the challenges for them to engage? And I think that's a um, great direction that we probably will do something in the next few years. Um, how do physicians react to engaged patients? <laughs> I think that, that would be a little bit frightening to them, that they would think that these patients are out there trying to learn all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. without appropriate guidance and so on. Physicians in general like the fact that patients are engaged, or are they? Well, that's what they say, right? The whole field is talking about we need our patient to be active. We need our patient to know about their own situation. They make informed decisions, they discuss with us. But I've seen the literature talking about, for example, there's people, quantified self literature talked about, right? When patients actually track all their information in the big spreadsheets and bring in to the doctor's office, they're not necessarily happy with it. Or the, I've heard that people talking about uh, when the patient actually search everything on internet and they bring a lot of questions that maybe are related to the visit itself, their healthcare itself, the, pa the doctor uh, may feel a little bit impatient or for that. And part of that, I mean, I have studied patient in provider interaction for many years. Part of that I think is um, there is a formal structure of the doctor's um, medical practice that the doctor only get that much time, right? They only have that much attention for each patient. There is a structure of national issues behind it. How do we accommodate engaged patient in the future? When the engaged patient come in with all their data, who is the person to review that data? Is this really the doctors? If thinking about you only have 15 minutes, do you have time to talk to the engagement patient and have more questions? Should we set up a different roles to do that work for doctors? That, I see, requires a huge organizational changes in, um, to accommodate that work. And I studied uh, with Kaiser almost 10 years ago, and they actually create one of the roles to, for example, to review Engaged patient would ask, pa ask doctor questions through email, and they actually create a role that this person would review and triage the email, mm -hmm. and making sure things are going fine. Then bring this message to the doctor, then address that message. So I think there is a little bit of resistance to, towards engaged patients, even though I think in general people all talk about how great engagement is. Um, but we need to make more changes to accommodate those engaged patients. So um, if you have more questions, I'm happy to talk to you downstairs during the social hour.